Welkom allemaal, iedereen die in, uh, in de sessie zit. Ik stel voor dat we nog even een minuutje wachten tot er wat uh, later mensen binnenkomen. Um, en dan uh, zal ik daarna beginnen. Uh, als jullie willen, ik heb een uh, link doorgestuurd in de, in de chat uh, zojuist. Uh, naar een Slido-pagina waarin jullie vragen kunnen stellen die je specifiek aan mij hebben. Um, en als ik jullie vast mag vragen om even jullie zelf voor te stellen en wat ongeveer je rol is uh, en uh, wat, je, wat je hoopt te horen in de, in de chat. Dan, uh, dan heel graag, dan zal ik er af en toe even een blik op, uh, op werpen. Jullie kunnen niet pla praten, zie ik in de chat, dus het wordt een beetje een richting verkeer. Maar goed, dat, uh... en dan zal ik hierna ook naar het Engels over, uh, overschakelen. Dat was de bedoeling, uh, begreep ik. Dus uh, gezien alles verder in het Engels is. Oké. Okay. Ik uh, zal even mijn scherm overschakelen. Ik stel voor dat we beginnen. I'll switch to English uh, from now on. Okay, um, welcome everybody here to this uh, session on uh, Corona Melder and the state of open source in the, the Dutch government. Um, I'll be talking about uh, some of the trends that I've been uh, seeing the last, uh, last couple of years uh, within the Dutch uh, government. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about my own experiences as um, community manager of Corona Melder, uh, the Dutch uh, COVID app. Um, and after that, I'll try to uh, predict uh, some of the trends and uh, see what, uh, what kind of uh, challenges we still have ahead. Um, so, um, yeah, like I said, you can uh, ask your questions at uh, the Slido link uh, at, the, at the top of the screen. Uh, I'll just double check and see if everybody can hear me, because this is a bit, takes a bit of getting used to. Well, I'm assuming everybody can hear me now. Um, Okay, yeah, so welcome to this, uh, to this session. Um, please allow me to, uh, to introduce myself briefly. My name is uh, Edo Plantekra. I have uh, studied uh, artificial intelligence in the city of Groningen. I work as a freelance uh, project manager or program manager for digital government. Um, I was one of the initiators of both the Drupal Overhead Network uh, work, uh, which has been uh, active for a couple of years, but not for, uh, for some, uh, some years now and also of the Gebruiker Central Network, which is the user needs first network, a uh, network of people in government uh, striving to make the government more user friendly. I'm currently employed uh, on a contract basis uh, as a community manager of uh, Corona Melder, uh, the Dutch uh, COVID app. Um, so let me start by briefly uh, uh, telling you a little bit about uh, Corona Melder. Um, I'll start with a short uh, film about how the, um, uh, the Corona Melder works. I'm starting up the image right now. Okay, I understood that from the um, uh, from the chat that the, the sound is not working. Um, oh, now it restarts. So I'll so I'll briefly tell you a little bit about the uh, about the app. Uh, so what the uh, Corona Melder app does, it, it warns you if you've been close to somebody who has been later diagnosed with the coronavirus. Um, as uh, most of you know, uh, you can um, uh, pass on the coronavirus to other people. Uh, before you're, uh, you have uh, um, before the uh, you have the first uh, symptoms symptoms, um, and what the app does is uh, without tracking location or without tracking the identity of people, uh, it can still warn you about if you've been uh, close to uh, to somebody in uh, in the past couple of days. Um, the way the app does this is by using a little a little trick, uh, so to speak. Um, where it uses uh, randomly exchanged Bluetooth uh, Bluetooth codes. Um, uh, which are uh, exchanged between uh, two different uh, different phones, and it uses the Bluetooth uh, signal strength as a measurement of uh, the proximity of the two people. Uh, so in this way, you can um, allow people to have a notification if they've been close to somebody who was later diagnosed with uh, Corona, without uh, using people's identity and without using uh, GPS location. 
Um, you can download the, uh, the app at coronamelder.nl slash EN. It's, it's not a Drupal website, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I have to admit. Um, and, uh, and you can read more about the, about the app over there. Uh, but I'll be, uh, I'll be mostly talking about the, the process, how the app uh, came, uh, came to be. Um, so yeah, first of all, why uh, we chose to develop in the, uh, in the open. And there's a number of uh, advantages in this particular case. Uh, first and foremost, it's about uh, trust, uh, because it's a, a bit counterintuitive the way the app works. Um, you would expect uh, the app to uh, uh, use your location and use your identity, because uh, intuitively you would say like, okay, if I can warn somebody, I need this, this person's uh, contact uh, details, because otherwise I can't warn them. Uh, and I'll need to use their uh, know their location as well. So um, this is a bit of a, uh, the, the trick that we used is a bit of counterintuitive, uh, and so uh, the trust was a was a high um, was a was a big consideration uh, using a, uh, using an open source project uh, process like this. Um, Secondly, the quality was also a uh, consideration. Uh, there's been, there have been hundreds of people uh, that have been uh, following the, uh, the, the, the development of the app uh, and uh, given their uh, feed, feedback. Uh, so obviously that's just something for quality. And also the collaboration, it makes it a lot easier to collaborate both with a community of people that are a uh, community of experts that are looking onto, uh, that are uh, watching all the developments, but also internally uh, for example, uh, audits or um, uh, other organizations that are involved in the uh, development of the uh, the app, but also people that are interested in the um, um, biologically biological and epidemiological uh, parts of the uh, uh, of the functioning of the app. It makes it much easier to collaborate like that. Um, and lastly, also, it was a, a matter of engagement. Uh, we've noticed that there's a lot of people that have put a lot of effort in the um, uh, in the app. Uh, and they also help us uh, answer questions online. Uh, so we, we grew a, a large community in uh, such, a, such a manner. Uh, so to put this all in perspective a little bit, I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of uh, Corona Melder in the, in the process uh, later on. Uh, but to put it um, into, uh, into perspective a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about the state of open source in government, in uh, the Dutch government uh, specifically. Um, we've come quite a quite a long way in the, in the last couple of uh, couple of years uh, in 2008 there's been a large program called the Nederland Open in Verbinding uh, which was uh, about the promotion of open source software in the in the government but it was mainly focused on off-the-shelf uh, software and uh, like the ecosystem that we have at the at the moment uh, with uh, several open source uh, platforms several open source languages um, there wasn't such a stress on that uh, back uh, back uh, back then, and the landscape has, has changed a fair a fair bit uh, since then. Um, only two years ago, uh, I um, co-initiated uh, an open letter to the Dutch uh, government, basically uh, uh, trying to stop them uh, fr from changing a law, uh, the law called the Wet Markt en Overheid, the the law about the market and uh, and government. Uh, it's it's intended to um, uh, not disturb the the market for uh, for uh, for commercial parties uh, by the government providing free services, and they were tr trying to make this law stricter uh, or more strict, um, and this would have prevented effectively uh, the use of uh, or the, the the publishing of open source uh, source code by the government. Um, so. Pretty much, it was almost uh, uh, made impossible to use open source in, uh, in government uh, uh, entirely. Um, since then, um, there have been has been an open source movement coming around, which has uh, got fair, a fair bit of traction in, in government, uh, mainly around uh, municipalities. And uh, only in April this uh, this year, um, the Raymond Knops, the um, uh, Minister of uh, Internal Affairs. Uh, stated that uh, the use of open source uh, software should be uh, used by by default by, uh, by government so in those uh, those two years uh, since uh, 2018 uh, a lot has happened uh, actually and in uh, may only a month later the corona melder uh, project was uh, was started uh, so this is uh, to give you a little bit of context on uh, uh, in the, the field we were working in um, okay, so a bit of a, about the timeline of the, the project, just to give you some uh, idea about how the, uh, the, uh, the app came, uh, came to be. Um, it all started in probably March or April, uh, so somewhere. 
uh, where our uh, ministry of, uh, Minister of Health, Hugo de Jonge, uh, surprised everybody, stating uh, there should be two, uh, two apps to, uh, to combat the effects of uh, COVID-19. And uh, shortly afterwards, uh, a coalition came, uh, came together uh, of privacy-minded organizations uh, stating 10 uh, uh, principles that such an app should uh, adhere to. Uh, I was one of the uh, initiators of this, uh, this initiative by my, uh, myself. Uh, the most important uh, of, uh, one um, was no central storage of personal data. So there have been a number of apps in uh, abroad where uh, all the personal data and the GPS or and the locations of people are stored in a central database. Well, I've tried to explain um, that we've, took a, we've taken a different approach, much more privacy preserving. Uh, so I think this is the most, uh, most important one of the, uh, of the 10. Uh, there have been a number of scandals in uh, abroad uh, where there have been privacy leaks and uh, all kinds of uh, information shared where, uh, unintentionally. Uh, so after that, uh, there was an, um, uh, an appathon, uh, which basically was a market consultation where uh, the, the Ministry of Health uh, asked uh, commercial parties to uh, come up with their uh, solutions because there were, at the time there were already a number of such, uh, such apps. Um, and they did the market consultations to, to see if uh, anything was available at the market. Um, and that was popcorn time because seven, uh, seven parties were, uh, were selected. Um, to do an, uh, an open uh, live streamed uh, event uh, where they had to present their solution. And everybody, um, well, none of the seven solutions actually uh, turned out to be uh, usable in, in practice. Um, so uh, there were a lot of people uh, looking, uh, uh, look, uh, looking, and, uh, looking at these streams and commenting. And uh, I think on the, the, the platform that we used for that of, uh, of the Code for NL Foundation, there were about 15,000 uh, messages uh, uh, posted in, uh, in one, uh, one weekend. So that was, a, was an interesting process. So, but in the end, it turned out that uh, none of these seven solutions um, uh, were, were viable at that uh, time. So what the ministry uh, decided to do is to form an, a team of uh, uh, both government experts and external experts. Um, and they asked uh, the most um, uh, critical people during this, uh, this epithon uh, to uh, help them um, build, the, build the app, basically. The ten uh, safe against Corona principles were quickly uh, quickly embraced as a um, as a uh, foundation of the of the project. Uh, there was a, an existing community of the uh, Code for NL Foundation, which is a foundation for uh, developers and designers that are involved in government, but also for uh, working for foundations for for the greater good, basically. And it uh, quickly grew from about uh, three hundred people to about three thousand uh, people in the last uh, last half uh, half year. Uh, then a lot of a uh, lot of work went into building uh, building and designing the app, and then there was a regional test uh, where a, a limited uh, amount of people could uh, could already use the app in the midst of uh, August, and then it took a long time before a law was passed, and the national launch um, was in uh, in the midst of uh, October, so quite uh, quite recently, and at the moment we're nearing four million uh, million downloads of the app. Uh, so to tell you a little bit about the open source uh, project, uh, process, uh, to give you a bit of an, uh, bit of an insight, um, we uh, did a lot of usability uh, testing with a lot of uh, people from different, uh, different backgrounds. And all the, the whole design process was uh, openly uh, documented uh, on, uh, on GitHub as, as well. Uh, so people could comment on, on the, 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 the designs under development uh, and people could help improve them. Actually, some people get, and got, uh, got access to the, to the Figma files. Um, and uh, this is one example where, one, uh, where a blind uh, person uh, uses the app. You can follow the link if I send you the presentation later on. Uh, and you can see that the, it, she was actually much, much quicker than uh, people that with, uh, with, uh, with normal vision, uh, which was really interesting to see. Uh, so it was really an open, a very open process. So it was more, we, get, we, um, uh, we went way beyond uh, publishing the uh, uh, just the, the source code as open source, uh, we actually the whole uh, the process and the design uh, process and everything uh, was uh, was open, inclu including the results of penetration tests and stuff uh, stuff like that. Um, we had a, a number of sessions where uh, people could uh, interact uh, directly with uh, the uh, the people in the, in the team. Uh, so in this case, this was a session with uh, the Secretary General of uh, VWS, VWS, Erik Gerritsen, 
Um, and uh, there were a number of people uh, directly di discussing uh, uh, the, uh, the working of the, the, the process of the, of the project, uh, including people from Bits of uh, Freedom and other uh, privacy, uh, privacy minded, uh, minded people. And my own uh, role in this, uh, this whole process was to uh, facilitate these, uh, these kinds of sessions and also to make sure uh, that all the work that the team did was, uh, could be, be followed on uh, via GitHub and other, other channels via Slack channel as well. Uh, so everybody could uh, participate in the discussions and um, yeah, suggest, uh, make, some, make suggestions. Um, and uh, some, uh, some tech uh, journalists, and journalists were also in this, uh, this call and they, uh, he also, uh, Daniel Falani is quite well known um, and he, uh, he also noticed how, uh, how special it was and that, uh, that it was done in this uh, such an open way. Um, so to talk briefly a bit about community uh, distributions, uh, we had a lot of uh, lot of useful uh, useful inputs from the community. We estimated that uh, at least uh, uh, many thousands of hours uh, that people uh, put in, put in uh, their their free time to to help us improve uh, improve the app. Um, most of it was a long tail of uh, accessibility uh, recommendations, translations, uh, community uh, or uh, troubleshooting, uh, helping out with the technical do documentation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there have been over 25,000 Slack posts in the, in the, Slack, uh, in the Slack discussion uh, forum, uh, a large part of uh, backend source code from an open source project that was started in the Netherlands was, uh, was adopted. Uh, somebody did a user research uh, about, uh, about the app with over 500 people responding. All of this is, uh, came from a community of, uh, of volunteers. Uh, test community offered their services and um, the Safe Against Corona. We made a made a, a dashboard uh, tracing these uh, these ten uh, ten principles, which actually ended up in the in the in the website of the project in the in the end, which is why it's not a Drupal website uh, by by, uh, by the way. And a uh, nice thing about this was um, we uh, asked uh, Hugo de Jonge, the, the minister, uh, to thank uh, the people uh, uh, for all their uh, their efforts and their their volunteer efforts uh, specifically. Uh, by uh, updating the website uh, status, so when it went live, uh, he himself uh, posted a, a big thank you to the to the community, which was a nice, uh, nice uh, touch. So we uh, we thought, okay, so what does this all mean for uh, open source soft, uh, software in uh, in government? Um, well, some trends uh, that I uh, that I see in uh, in government um, is. Um, there's a, a, a bit of a, 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 a counter a, a trend and a counter trend, I suppose, uh, wherein uh, government and society in, in general is, is becoming more and more complex. Uh, laws are becoming more complex, uh, but there's also a call for more uh, simplicity for the end uh, user uh, to not drive every, uh, uh, every citizen crazy with all the, uh, the laws and uh, things, uh, things they need to, um, uh, to do with, uh, with the government. Uh, so more collaboration uh, is necessary uh, also to uh, make uh, customer journeys across organizations because uh, at a lot of live events you have to deal with a number of uh, both government organizations uh, and also uh, organizations outside government. Uh, so this also means that there's more, uh, we need more co uh, collaboration and more uh, collaboration across organizations as well. Um, there's a call for more standardization of, uh, of design. Uh, I uh, co-initiated the NL design system uh, for, uh, for this. I won't get into details of, uh, of that. Um, accessibility is becoming more and more important. Uh, uh, in September, a new law came to pass uh, where every uh, government website uh, needs to uh, adhere to the, uh, the uh, WCAG uh, standards and uh, the accessibility standards. Um, there's a large call for more uh, transparency uh, to put people in, in charge of their own, uh, their own data more. And uh, vendor lock-in is also an, uh, so an issue. And finally, we also need to deal with uh, general distrust of, uh, of government, which is, uh, well, I won't have to, uh, have to go into details about that at the, at the moment. I think we all know uh, what I mean. Uh, but all of these uh, trends, I think, have something to do with um, uh, a, a good uh, breeding ground for, uh, for open source uh, software. And I would like to uh, point towards some uh, some projects and organizations uh, that are happening at the moment in uh, within uh, Dutch uh, the government, uh, which which I think is uh, specifically uh, interesting for the for the Drupal community as well. 
Uh, first of all, a lot of people uh, of you might have heard of uh, Drupal for Gemeenten and uh, the uh, website internet model of, uh, of uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the uh, what the abbreviation stands for uh, of uh, the DIMPACT uh, cooperation, which is two separate uh, Drupal distributions, which are now uh, being merged into an open online uh, distribution. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, project to uh, to keep an eye on, I think. Um, only for municipalities at the moment. Uh, I also briefly mentioned the common ground uh, movement. Uh, there's a, a general trend uh, f within communities, which are all basically have the similar um, uh, services, of course. Uh, there's a there's a trend to collaborate more on the on the basis of an open uh, open source uh, basis. So several projects are being uh, developed in an open source manner and being shared across uh, uh, several municipalities. I uh, already briefly mentioned the NL design system, uh, which is a standardized uh, way of uh, uh, making your user, user interfaces uh, with accessible uh, components and uh, a standard way of, uh, of user, uh, uh, using user tested uh, components to uh, uh, build uh, consistent uh, online services for the government. And uh, um, an organization I would like to briefly mention is the Foundation for Public Code, which is a nonprofit organization um, that helps uh, governments to uh, publish their, pro their public uh, code, their open source uh, software, uh, which adheres to, adheres to certain, uh, certain standards which are uh, specifically uh, uh, made and also uh, some, some best practices are lever leveraged in that. Um, so uh, it makes it easier for governments to publish high quality uh, open source software code for specifically for uh, for public organization. And finally, uh, I briefly mentioned the code for NL community. I used to be a board member of this uh, this community my, uh, myself as a, as a, as a disclaimer, um, uh, where a lot of a uh, lot of developers and designers get to uh, get together and collaborate. Uh, around uh, software systems within government, but also uh, uh, close to uh, close to the government. Some of the challenges that I uh, that I see ahead uh, for um, for open source software within the government, um, it's uh, not automatically uh, uh, you, publishing open source software doesn't mean that there's op automatically an ecosystem of suppliers and and governments that that are uh, collaborating. So I think this is quite a quite a challenge uh, to not just uh, publish software and and uh, put it on uh, on GitHub and uh, be done with it, um, but actually to uh, make sure that there's an alternative for uh, the current market, which is uh, still basically still mostly based on a proprietary uh, software. And also, uh, like I said, the letter of, uh, that uh, letter of, um, uh, the policy letter that was uh, published by the Ministry of uh, Interior Affairs. Um, saying that uh, open source software should be the default uh, choice. Uh, that's of course very uh, very nice in, in theory, but in the, the Dutch polder model, uh, a lot of people um, uh, still need to be convinced to actually take the first step for uh, for developing open uh, open source software and publishing their open source uh, software. Um, okay, I would like to uh, briefly go to uh, that's uh, that's it uh, for uh, for now. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm, uh, I'll take a look at the at the chat and also to the to the Slido uh, to see if there's any questions. Um, I have two questions in the in the Slido um, uh, in the Slido application. Uh, one of them is why it does not support uh, iOS uh, 13. Um, yeah, the the software um, uh, the the Coronamel software uh, uses a framework uh, made by Apple and Google. Um, and um, uh, it's it's dependent on this uh, this particular uh, framework, so it it works between uh, the two different brands of uh, of uh, of uh, phones. Um, they only support the more recent, and it, which is in the last uh, last five uh, five years uh, of of phones. Uh, so this is there's a technical reason for this, and uh, why iOS 13 is not uh, supported is uh, in the hands of uh, of Apple. But 95% of the uh, the phones are are supported. And another one, what uh, percentage of people are using the app? Is that enough for, for the app to be uh, successful? Uh, downloads does not uh, in, uh, equal formal usages. Uh, that's uh, true. The more people that uh, use the app, of course, uh, the, the more effective it is. The way um, the current number of downloads 
is uh, quite uh, quite uh, sufficient for the app to be uh, uh, to be successful. Uh, but the more people use it, the more um, uh, the more effective it is, of course, because if only one of the people uh, that, that that are in contact with each other has uh, has the app installed on the phone, uh, well, both uh, both you, both people need to, need to have it installed because otherwise, of course, no uh, no contact can be uh, can be logged. Um, we don't know for sure what percentage of people are using the app, and that has to do with uh, the high um, uh, high uh, bar we set for the for the privacy preserving uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, the, the, the flip side of that is that uh, it's not uh, a, a lot of data that we would like to have. We can't uh, can't have um, because we can't uh, uh, see how many people open the app. Uh, for uh, for example, there are some proxy uh, uh, data we can uh, we can look at, but it's not a, an exact uh, science. So I uh, honestly don't have the answer to this uh, this question. Um, okay, I'll switch to the to the chat. Let's see if there's. More questions over there. Um, okay, if you have any more questions, then uh, please uh, ask them over uh, over the chat. I don't see any new questions coming up at the moment. Unfortunately, I can't uh, can't hear you all because otherwise it would have been a bit bit more natural to uh, to talk about your questions or your thoughts. But okay, since I don't see any new questions coming in, I would like to thank you for your uh, for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please give me uh, me feedback uh, via via Twitter at uh, Edo Plantinga. I'm curious to hear what you uh, what you thought, and uh, thank you very much for uh, for joining this talk. And have a have a nice day at the rest of the the conference. Uh, thank you very much. Bye bye. Ah, there's one more question. Yeah, just we still have two minutes, so why not? Just uh, let the let the questions keep uh, keep coming in. Uh, do you know if other countries are forking working on the same code base? base? No, now at the moment uh, I don't. Uh, I'm, we are not uh, not aware of other uh, other uh, other countries actually forking the code base. Uh, what I do know um, is that uh, a lot of uh, countries have uh, published their uh, their source codes uh, uh, the the source code on uh, via via GitHub, uh, and of course we are uh, uh, looking uh, looking into to other code bases as well as well to see if we what we can learn. Um, but the base, uh, basically, the barrier to, do, to this is that a lot of um, uh, a large part of the code base is in the in the backend, and uh, the backend is uh, dependent on the uh, the health uh, organizations, the GGD in, in in the Netherlands, uh, that all have different uh, processes. Uh, so that makes it hard to actually uh, copy paste an existing code base. Okay, well. If there's no more questions, thanks again for uh, for your time and um, enjoy the rest of the um, of the Drupal Jam. Thank you. Bye bye.